Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? Pretty good. Had a good week? A great week. Just yeah. in my studio painting, so nothing changes. <laughs> How often are you in your studio? I'm in my studio every day. Love it. Yeah. And were you doing this before the pandemic in your studio as well? I've been doing this for almost 40 years. My and, God, so uh, nothing yeah. really changed with the pandemic other than... Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a small world I live in uh, uh, um, in terms of artwork. Um, I, I come into my studio every single day and uh, I'm either painting or researching a painting or mm -hmm. working on something. So yeah. it's a seven day a week job for me. Wow. And are you from Alberta originally, or where are you from, Gord? No, I'm originally from Hamilton, Ontario. Okay. Yeah. 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 What brought yeah. you out here? Oh, my wife and I moved out here way back in 1977. And uh, just uh, a longing to get away from, from where we grew up and to start a new life. And, and, and we've stayed here ever since. Yeah. Do you guys, well, before the pandemic, did you guys go visit out there? Or do you still have family out there? Uh, Karen still has family back there, and we we'd go occasionally, but uh, but not all that often. Every few years. No, that's wonderful. Now, you got to tell me a story. Did this this magnificent talent that you have? Did it come at an early age, or did you grow into it? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I've always liked to draw. Yeah. Um, and I've always liked artwork. Uh, but it wasn't anything huge in my life really until I got to university and I, I chose to take the, uh, the arts program at McMaster. Uh, after that, um, I, I, I majored in printmaking and sculpture when I was way back in school and, uh, and reached a point probably in the, oh, probably in the early 90s, mid 90s, where I was looking for a change in direction in, mm -hmm. in the type of artwork I was doing and decided to start painting. And uh, since I had no uh, formal training in painting at all, it was like a clean slate for me. I was able to not have any uh, uh, sort of preconceived notions of what I should be doing. And I was able to um, just paint the way I liked. You have a fascination with people, portraits. Yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, it's the hardest thing in the world for me to do. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess that's what you focus on. Um, but yeah, I love people. Um, one of my favorite things in the world to do, and uh, which is very difficult now with the pandemic, is uh, just getting myself a cup of coffee and sitting down in a, uh, you know, an airport or a crowded area or a park and just watch people go by and you, know, you see everything. Mm -hmm. um, so just observation and, uh, and that's really the, uh, the basis of, uh, of how I approach any kind of portraiture or any paintings at all really. Right. It's interesting to see, well, your story with sculptures and I mean, the portrait behind you that you've done here, you can really see that you pay attention to the details of the arm and the elbows yeah. and... Yeah, small details, it's yeah. important. <laughs> what, what do you call this kind of pieces that you do? It's um, geometric in a way? Uh, boy, people ask me that all the time and I don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, I, um, I've, I've given it a lot of thought and uh, I don't know, um, I, I, I see a lot of artists out there who are, who are very, able to describe in detail what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, what they're trying to achieve and how they're getting there. And uh, there's, there's almost a language that's been developed um, uh, by artists, by, by patrons, by art uh, administrators that, uh, that is an attempt to try and describe something that I think is undescribable. Um, for me, I paint the way I want to paint, and um, and and this is how it is. Uh, uh, and through that process, um, I try to uh, try to learn and grow with every painting I do. But to describe what it is, um, 
or how I go about it is something that I, I really can't, I can't figure it out by myself. Yeah. Um, I just come in and I do it and there's good days and there's bad days and, uh, and always moving forward. Yeah. No, uh, one second here. I don't know. My audio is getting a little weird there. All right. There we go. Uh, now, do you use oil or is it acrylic? It's acrylic. Acrylic. Yeah. 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 So it's an easier medium to work with, I would say, in certain ways. Yeah. Uh, oils terrify me. <laughs> Acrylic's far easier for me, um, especially with the background I have that, uh, and I'm very comfortable with them, with them now. Um, uh, it's my preferred medium. Do you, what inspires you when you are about to start or how do you get into the zone, I guess, let's say that? Well, again, that's, uh, uh, it's a difficult one to answer because, um, I find there really is no zone for me. Um, I, I view what I do, I've done it for so long, I view it as my job. And um, so I come out to my studio every day and no matter what frame of mind I in, I'm in, I have to get down to work. And uh, uh, sometimes it's really easy to do that. Other times there's other issues that are complicating things, uh, but you have to clear your mind and, and just get down to work. Um, as for inspiration, um, you know, the, the people that I paint or the landscapes I'm working on are, are inspiration enough. Um, it's, uh, uh, I find it hard work. Um, uh, there's, uh, uh, I'm always envious of the artists who can uh, paint very prolifically. Uh, uh, I'm very slow at what I do. It takes me a long time, a lot of thought, a lot of thinking. Um, and uh, I, I certainly don't kind of produce a painting in a, in a flurry of emotion and, and uh, sort of inspiration. It, it's a real process for me. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. How did you, or what was your first experience with taking a painting and making it instead of a passion or a hobby to a real job or a career? Uh, Boy, that's a difficult question. Uh, Taking you I, back I, 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, like I say, I've always, I've always loved doing artwork. And um, I guess at a certain point, um, it just isn't a hobby anymore. Uh, you know, when you, when you graduate from, from school and you're starting out, um, uh, I think you're spending most of your try uh, of your time trying to make sense of what you've learned so far, and kind of, you're kind of picking and choosing uh, what you want to utilize and what you don't want to utilize. Uh, so you know that that process in itself took me probably ten or fifteen years mm -hmm. until I started to to work on painting, and then uh, by that time I, I was a full fledged artist and. You know, making my living at it. Um, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know that there was any exact moment where it kind of dawned on me. Um, I I think probably I realized it uh, for the first time uh, when I was commissioned to do the Canadian Sport Heroes collection. Um, um, that that was kind of a point with me where. It was like, hey, I, I'm actually getting paid to do this, and people want it, and uh, uh, and that lasted for quite a few years. Um, uh, and it was kind of at that point, I guess, that I realized that, yeah, this is this is my life. This is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Gordon, for the people that don't know exactly what you did there, do you mind explaining what that's all about? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, I. Um, I reached a uh, kind of a crossroads in my in my career, uh, and decided to start painting instead of printmaking. Um, and I I wasn't sure what I wanted to paint at that time. That would have been in the sort of mid '90s. Uh, and I decided that I've always loved sports. Um, I was involved in sports when I was younger, and 
and uh, I love sports, especially the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I decided to approach some Olympians that I'd followed when I was younger and uh, ask them if they would pose for paintings. The first three, three people that I approached were uh, uh, all Calgary people. Uh, they were Willie DeWitt, who was uh, a boxer, um, Michael Smith, who was decathlete, and uh, Diane jones Konakowski, who was a uh, pentathlete. And to my surprise, they all agreed to, to pose for me. Um, and I did portraits of them. And from, and from that, um, the... Uh, Canadian Sport Institute in Calgary uh, was excited about what was happening. They saw it as a good uh, tribute to Olympic athletes and uh, a good kind of medium to uh, to uh, uh, base marketing on and, and whatnot. And uh, from that point on, uh, they commissioned me to uh, to paint further paintings, uh, and uh, that spanned over well, probably ten years. If you hadn't reach out to those three people initially and done that work and put in that work for free, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have gone where you are today in, in terms right. of that. Yeah. Well, art's about taking a chance and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's funny. There's a kind of a funny story that, that I have that, uh, way back in the early nineties, um, there was a, uh, uh, a, a uh, Calgary businessman man named Frank Sisson, and he had a he had a, a place called uh, Frank Sisson Silver Dollar Action Center, mm-hmm. and it was part bowling alley and part restaurant and uh, part Frank casino. Frank Sisson had the casino, didn't he? Uh, yeah, part okay. casino, and he had the uh, and there was a music venue there as well, and uh, uh, Garth Brooks was playing at that uh, at that venue. And Mr. Sisson uh, uh, commissioned me to do a portrait of Garth at that time. I never got to meet him. It was about the only person I've done a portrait of that I never got to meet. So I had to work from photographs. And I was just starting with uh, uh, portraiture at that point. And uh, I look back at what I did and oh man, it was horrible, it was horrible. It was, uh, it was like, the biggest chance you're going to get at exactly the wrong time. <laughs> uh, so um, I was just remembering that uh, in the last few months, and um, I decided to try and contact Garth Brooks and tell him that story and see if he'd give me a shot at doing another portrait. You know, no strings attached. I didn't want to get paid. I, I wasn't looking for anything except for a chance to kind of redeem myself. Um, um, where that portrait was concerned and you know maybe even produce something that he would hang up in his home or or whatever Uh, so i put together a package and i spent days were making a letter to uh, explain the whole thing and send it off to them and uh, it's like throwing a you know putting a a note in a bottle and throwing it in the ocean and uh, i haven't heard anything back yet but who knows what's going to happen so you know unless you ask uh, you know, 99% of the people that I've approached uh, to do portraits of have all said yes. And uh, uh, so you got to take a chance and you've got to get used to hearing the word no and uh, and just keep moving forward, inching forward all the time. You would be where you are today if you hadn't done that, those three free portraits at that interview. No, No, I don't think I'd be where I am today. Um, I, that was a, a real critical moment in my career. Um, and like, uh, you know, I've met so many amazing people because of that. And, uh, uh, and the, you know, uh, there's so many people who were involved in the planning of it. And, uh, you know, the, uh, um, um, the commission of it, um, uh, and, and so many people who put their faith in me. Uh, where that was concerned, um, that, uh, you know, there's a lot to be thankful for there. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm very proud of those pieces and, and it certainly has shaped my career. Do you take pictures of your pieces and keep it in a file and say, look back sometimes, whoa, that looks a little interesting. (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, I have photographs of pretty much everything I've done. Um, some hidden away and, uh, and some I look at quite often. But uh, the uh, Canadian Sport Heroes collection um, is something that I send pictures out of those, of those portraits quite often to, to different venues and whatnot. How many have you done of individuals? 16. Wow. Yeah. And who's behind you right now, that lady? Beautiful. This is uh, Serena Sanford. Uh, she was a ballerina. She retired about a year ago. And she, uh, she danced with both the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and the Alberta Ballet. And uh, I've done two portraits of, of Serena. Um, she's an amazing person, an amazing dancer. And what's behind you, Gordon? That's looks. Uh, the one behind me is called uh, uh, Sunlight uh, Morning Sunlight Studio B. Um, once a week, uh, for the past twenty years prior to COVID, uh, I went to Alberta Ballet every Tuesday morning to draw the dancers in their uh, in their class. And uh, this is based on Studio B, where I am every Tuesday morning. Uh, uh, I always try and get there early uh, because there is the dancers warming up, they're stretching, they're chatting with one another. And there's a real peaceful kind of ambiance in the studio at that time. Um, and on some very selective mornings, there is a quality of sunshine that comes into the room through the big, big windows that just bathes everything in kind of a golden light. And that's what that painting is about. Interesting. Have you had any paintings with Hattori? Yes, I have. Uh, Yukichi. Yes. Um, uh, actually, Yukichi and I uh, collaborated on, uh, uh, on an evening in Fernie a few years ago. Um, I was having a, an exhibit at the Fernie Museum and Yukichi had been invited down um, with some students from his school uh, to do a performance, an evening performance. And uh, while they were doing their performance, I, I did a, a live painting of, uh, of his production. Uh, it was very exciting. And getting to work with someone like Yukichi is, well, it just, it's amazing. It's beautiful to watch him. It is. He's, a, he's an incredible dancer and a really nice person as well. What drew you to ballet? Uh, again, um, it was, I was starting to do portraiture. And again, it was just a phone call. Um, I thought it would be great to draw ballet dancers or paint them. And so I phoned Alberta Ballet and explained what I wanted to do. And they agreed to put a little note on, on their notice board um, uh, so if any dancers were interested, excuse me, they could get in touch with me. Um, a dancer by the name of, um, oh my God, I've gone blank. <laughs> um, oh man, doesn't matter. Anyway, years ago, uh, she responded and said she'd like to have a portrait done. And as I got to know her, uh, she invited me to class um, uh, to draw the dancers and at that time, uh, Ali Pafarouk was the, uh, the artistic director at Alberta Ballet, and he was uh, kind enough to let me stay. And then uh, Mika Nissanen after that, and Jean Gramat uh, currently have all been super supportive. And uh, like I say, it's been 20 years that I've been going there. And uh, uh, for the past year, of course, with COVID, I haven't been able to go, but uh, I miss it terribly <laughs> it's uh you asked about inspiration earlier and uh to watch those dancers um do what they do every day um people just don't realize the the work that goes involved um the effort and the dedication and uh you know when you go to see the ballet um everybody's dressed to the nines and it's a beautiful production and uh, um, you don't really realize the, you know, the, the real hard work that goes into, you know, performing at that level. Same with athletes, you know, these are elite athletes and I've been fortunate enough to get to see training sessions and whatnot. And 
man oh man you watch a couple of minutes of the olympics on tv and uh, and sit in your chair and criticize <laughs> and have no idea uh what they go through to get to that that point in their life um, did you fall in love with the olympics the calgary oh yes very much so yeah uh but more so in in uh 2010 in vancouver um the kind of official opening of the canadian sport heroes collection was was done during the olympics in vancouver and it was just a, an incredible time really incredible will we one day see a mural done in the city by you i don't know i don't know i've never done a mural before uh it's something i'd love to do someday but uh i don't know uh it's not something i'm i'm really uh kind of pursuing in any way so it would have to be someone would have to kind of come to me and say, hey, would you like to do this? And I, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you realize that you need the discipline to be an artist? Because especially being an artist, you see a lot of individuals say, well, I need to have a few drinks in me to really feel it. And yeah, you've heard all those stories. How did you realize, no, this is a job. I need to take this seriously. I don't have to wake up at two in the morning and do it and then go to sleep all day. And you, you made a routine for your life. Oh, that's exactly right. Um, I'm a person of routine um, <laughs> uh, for good or for bad. Uh, uh, but I couldn't do it without having a routine. You know, I, uh, I remember reading years ago that uh, uh, Canadian artist Alex Colville um, one of his neighbors said that every day at two o'clock they looked out their window and Alex Colville was walking his dog past, you know, along the beach. And I can understand that perfectly because I set my day up in a certain way. I like to get up early in the morning, you know, five, five thirty and read a book for a couple hours. And then I take my dog for a walk. And after all that, I'm uh, ready to get into my studio and start working. Um, and if I don't do that, uh, I find that I can stray. You know, my mind, uh, my mind strays to other things or I get uh, involved in other things. And I just feel that, uh, you know, if, if I want to produce artwork on a regular basis and continually improve at what I'm doing, then I have to be really serious um, about getting out into my studio and working whether I want to be working or not. And like, that's why when you said what in influences you in, or inspires you, um, there's a lot of things that do, but they don't really come into play with the actual day-to-day -day work of, uh, of, you know, building a painting or creating a painting. How do you know when it's enough when your painting is done? <laughs> it's the million dollar question. <laughs> Uh, just a feeling yeah. um, it uh, for me painting is all about a feeling um, whether you're doing a landscape or uh, or a portrait uh, for example in a portrait um, of course you want to have a likeness of the person uh, and hopefully a positive likeness of the person uh, but for me the main thing is to try and get a feeling of who the person is um, um, so I find that when I'm, I'm meeting a person to paint for the first time, um, and do some drawings and take some pictures and all that kind of prep work, uh, but it's the conversation uh, for a couple hours that's the important part. And, and uh, if you watch really closely and, and are really patient, um, those kind of answers come to you. Um, so with the painting itself, um, for its completion, it's 100% me sitting back and looking at it and saying, okay, I can sign my name at the bottom now. Um, um, and there's never a hurry where that's concerned. Um, I'm never in a hurry to meet a deadline or, or to, uh, you know, do a quick painting. Um, to me, it's, a, it's, like I said before, a long process and uh and it's important to me that i'm totally satisfied with it when i'm when i'm done so yeah 
I mean, have you had a lot of business from social media though, or it's been tough? No, no, no. I'm, I'm a social media failure. <laughs> Would you rather be a social media failure or a real life failure? Right? <laughs> I think a social media failure. Um, yeah, it's just not something I'm very good at. Um, you know, the artists have to uh, be pretty good at self promotion, and um, I'm I'm a pretty quiet person in that regard. So uh, I tend to keep um, to keep social media pretty pretty quiet. Um, I post pan, post my paintings and that's about it. Um, so it's a noisy world. <laughs> it is a noisy world. It is a noisy world and there's a million artists out there. So do you like to, are you an introvert by any chance? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of. I, I, I don't mind being by myself at all. Um, uh, I always say to my wife that, uh, you know, people don't think I'm funny, but I'm really funny. <laughs> Just based on what I say to myself in my yeah. studio. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, uh, I'm the person that uh, big events that kind of stands off to the side and watches everybody else. I, I admire your use of colors and lines. You really like to go very, it's soft, but it's not. I don't know how to describe your colors, your palette. Have you ever strayed away from it and gone really bold or d dark and then gone back? And... Um, not intentionally. Um, the, the way I paint is, is like building blocks. Mm -hmm. And um, um, when I do a portrait, I always do a little abstract piece uh, at the same time, which is only about eight by 10. And every color that I use in the painting, I put a dab on, on the, the second paint, uh, second little piece, uh, whether it, the colors are covered up on the on the main painting or not. So every single color that gets used is added into that little abstract piece, and um, I have a pretty clear idea right from the outset of the colors that I'm going to use or the palette that I'm going to use. Um, it's based on, um, again, feelings about people. Some people uh, have a real distinct aura about them, which if you can, if you can kind of tack on to that, it's really helpful. Um, other people just by how they talk, how they present themselves or sort of colors that kind of uh, work with that. Uh, same with landscapes. Um, you know, it's, it's the colors that are chosen are really chosen because um, of trying, trying to express something about the subject. Um, uh, and uh, like for an example, uh, with a landscape, um, there's a, a certain time of year in the, in the late summer and fall in Alberta especially in the evenings, where the quality of light uh, on the landscape looks like it feels like there's like it's covered with honey. It's just this beautiful golden. There's no other. I've never been anywhere else in the world where I've seen that kind of that kind of sense of color. And uh, there's a few landscapes of, of the Alberta foothills and especially down near the Old Man River along the Livingston Range that I've done. And, and that's, the, that's the feeling that I want to get. Um, so yeah, the colors I choose, um, it's a conscious decision, but, but it's based on, on real con concrete things. So it's a transfer of energy and the colors you find, or transfer of energy and the colors you find through that, right? I think so. I think so. Um, yeah. That's something that not many people can understand is to be intuitive and really see that aura of people and what you feel. Yeah. You have to open up. Um, uh, you have to, and, and I believe that that happens to the more you, uh, the more you observe, um, you know, watching people, uh, is an amazing thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think the more you watch people and just really kind of not 
not judgmental in any way, just, just observe um, that the, you get a better sense of, of who people are, uh, uh, what they're about. And, and when, if you can kind of figure those things out, then the colors that, that you choose to use in a painting, uh, it's a lot easier to, to figure that out as well. How do you find work-life balance? Sorry? How do you find work-life balance, Gordon? Uh, right now, pretty good. Um, uh, balance is so important in, in everything you do. Um, and, and like I said before, that you know, there are days I come into my studio where this is the last place in the world I want to be. Um, and you, it, that's just a matter of, you know, forgetting about balance and just setting your mind to uh, a point where I'm going to get down to work. And hopefully as if I work for a few hours here, I'll kind of come around. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart uh, <laughs> of being an artist. Uh, um, you know, I struggle with, uh, I struggle with myself a lot as well. Uh, and uh, um, that creates uh, difficulties at time, at times painting as well. Um, I had a very interesting experience recently because I just completed a portrait of, of my wife, Karen, and uh, we've been together for almost 50 years. Um, I've never done a, a portrait of a uh, a, someone who's really close to me or a loved one before. And that was a really difficult uh, process for me. Um, there's so much information. Uh, how do you paint uh, a portrait of a person uh, with a lifetime of shared, uh, you know, shared experiences and shared feelings? And, you know, you've raised kids together. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I can see why a lot of artists uh, shy away from, from doing portraits of loved ones because it, it, it was very tough. I was happy with what happened um, and with the final piece, uh, but it was, a, it was a difficult process. And it took me, um, well, a good month afterwards to kind of let those kind of feelings go and get myself prepared to do uh, another painting. I'm still having a bit of trouble getting ready to do another painting. But, uh, Is it yeah. And why did it take this long? And instead of doing it, say, I don't know, three years ago versus now? I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. Um, um, but boy, that's one I can't answer. Uh, you know, I have two sons. I haven't done portraits of them. Um, grandson, I haven't done portraits of them. Um, and I really had no intention of doing a portrait of, of my wife either. But after all these many years, and uh, uh, I thought it just kind of came to me one day that this is something I should do. Um, and especially at a time like this with COVID, um, where relationships become increasingly important. Uh, um, I, I think it, it creates a memory. Uh, it creates a togetherness. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, every trip, your first kid, everything was flashing back while you're making the lines yeah. and oh. exactly, exactly. Uh, there's so much information that, uh, like, I'm when I do a portrait, I I have maybe three or four hours with with the person I'm going to do a portrait of. And I have to gather all my information during that time. Um, so I have a very narrow and focused view on who the person is. Uh, and no matter how I feel when I go into my studio, it's pretty easy to just reconnect with that narrow focus uh, and get to work. But when you have a lifetime of memories and experiences, um, there's, like I say, there's so much information that it's very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, I, there were days where um, I came out to my studio and uh, I was very, very happy. There was other days where Karen and I were probably uh, uh, not on the best. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, 
Uh, so, you, you know, you, you walk out of the house, I come out to my studio, and then you have to kind of shed all of that and, uh, and focus on the task at hand. And I found it very hard. Oh, I can even imagine. Was there a lot of tears? There were some. Yeah. There were some. Uh, and like you said, a lot of uh, a lot of memories about things that I hadn't thought about in in a long, long time. Were yeah. they trigger points for you? Is that what they were? Um, in some ways, yes. Um, kind of emotional trigger points. Um, uh, I don't know how much um, that contributed to the actual painting or not. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a certain expression that I've known for many, many years that Karen has that I wanted to have, and I, I feel I got that, um, and a certain feeling about who she is, uh, or who she is to me, uh, and uh, I, I, I think I succeeded in that as well. What are some things that you've gone through that you've been able to, I mean, deal with or overcome? Oh, I struggle. Uh, I struggle with depression. Uh, I think many artists do. Um, it's a twenty-four hour a day thing for me. And uh, you, I, I've I've found over the years that I can recognize um, what the triggers are, uh, and uh, they can be really, really subtle. But I know what they are, and you have a choice at that point of kind of saying okay, I'm going to give in and it's going to overwhelm me or I'm going to fight back and it's not going to overwhelm me. Um, and uh, most of the time now, I'm able to fight back. Uh, there's the odd time where it slips in and that happens, but, uh, but it never goes away. And it's something that you have to be conscious of all the time. And, and it's a, it's a, a, constant fight um a war really uh, I, I watched your interview with theo flurry and he said that uh if he lives in his own brain nothing good happens <laughs> and i thought that's a perfect way of describing it um so as a as a private person and a a, uh, a pretty quiet person i don't have a lot of interaction with other people um, and uh, uh, so that can be that can be something that's that's a difficult thing to deal with. Were you self-aware, or how did you become self-aware that you had depression, and uh, and then finding out these are my trigger points that bother me? Um, just years and years and years of dealing with it. Um, it, uh, um, you know, you. I, don't, I, I imagine it's difficult, different for everybody, but you reach a point where you know what, uh, what's going to happen if you give in. And uh, uh, I reached a point where I just don't want to go there anymore. It's, you know, every time you go there, it's, a, it's tougher to climb back out. And... Uh, and I don't know when that happened, uh, just that it happened over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You find ways. Uh, like I say, it's a choice. It's a conscious choice that uh, um, is, you know, some of the strangest things can trigger it. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it colors uh, at times, uh, certain colors? Uh, no, colors don't trigger it. Colors help. Um, uh, I think it's why I paint with such bright colors. That uh, um, living in Alberta uh, with nine months of winter, <laughs> um, I, I find that uh, painting with bright colors really, really helps my outlook uh, on a day to day basis. Did the pandemic bring you down in any way? Not really. Um, uh, it hasn't really changed my world a whole lot because of what I do, but I am finding that as it goes along further and further, that having um, 
as someone who observes people all the time, uh, I have difficulty with seeing people in masks. Um, um, I, I like pe seeing people smiling and I like seeing expressions on, on faces. Uh, and uh, uh, no, I can't say it's, it's really affected me in a huge way, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm usually a very uh, self-disciplined person. Uh, and motivated person. And I'm finding with the lack of um, things to do outside the studio mm -hmm. that it's a bit tougher to get motivated every single day. Uh, I, I love grocery shopping and uh, I like taking my time when I go grocery shopping and grocery shopping is no fun right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> People and it kind of brings you down. When you see it does. With masks, you're like, is this really happening? Yeah. Like there's something that that's a trigger for me at times, seeing people in masks. I'm like, mm -hmm. is this our world? Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. yeah what have we done? Yeah. How did we get here? Um, uh, yeah. I have people smiling at you with their eyes. Uh, you know, I know everyone's trying, but uh, uh, I, I like seeing people. I like seeing their faces. Do you feel like it's hard to find or see someone's aura? when the mask is on or you can very it. much so very much so uh, but, uh, um, yeah very difficult <laughs> <laughs> do you and your wife drink wine or champagne or anything to keep you guys selves occupied in the evenings nowadays not really no not really um we play uh we play scrabble yeah maybe have a drink while we're playing scrabble something like that crib <laughs> no, not lately, but we have. Yeah, uh, yeah Scrabble's a big competition right now. No, I'm on a bit of a winning streak. Are you? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and are, you guys are in Calgary though, right? Like, uh, we're outside of Calgary, a uh, town called Turner Valley. Oh, uh, with, yeah. yeah. It's about uh, 45 minutes southwest of Calgary. Turner Valley, yeah. I've been to Turner. You guys have the oil derricks there, the oldest. Yeah, it's where oil, uh, gas, and oil were discovered. In discovered, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's where uh, we've lived. I think you have a pub there, right in the corner. It's a hotel, or is that uh, in, in Turner Valley? No, in Black Diamond, there's the Black Diamond Hotel. That's Black true. Diamond's like right next door uh, to Turner Valley. Um, but yeah, you love it out there. Or? Yeah. Um, uh, both of us love uh, uh, Alberta, especially where we live. Um, you know, the, the we have a beautiful view of the mountains from where we live, and and uh, I don't know. There's, uh, it's such a unique landscape in in southern Alberta. It's an incredible landscape. Um, the only negative to me about living here is uh, the long winter. Uh, and it's not so much the cold, it's the fact that there's no color. It's, it's white and it's brown and it's gray. Mm -hmm. There's a blue sky. Um, and uh, I'm really dependent on color uh, um, to keep my, uh, uh, kind of keep my, um, how would I say it? Sanity. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm with you on that in the winter. I was just looking outside and this time around it really brought me down. The color mm -hmm. is just gray and yeah. that soft blue or whatever it is. And I said, nope, I can't look. I gotta go downstairs. Yeah, I know it's it's tough. Uh and it lasts for so long. Even if the weather's nice, there's no color. Uh and uh uh so I what I try and do is is try and find color wherever I can. And you know, when you look out into a field and you think it's just a brown field, um, I try and see as many different uh, kind of variations or tones of, of the browns, grays, or whatever. Uh, there's a lot more color out there than you think, but you have to really look for it. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of drab. <laughs> Has there been days that you struggle with a mind block? Or you just or that creative block where you're like, I can't figure this out, and you're stuck on that one painting. Oh yeah, yeah. There are there are. I can go days on end uh, working on like this big a piece of of a painting, 
uh, and is just not going where I wanted it to go. Um, over the years, though, I have found uh, a few little tricks uh, that I can use that if I'm really, really stuck, um, just in terms of uh, uh, the color that I'm using, um, I find that, uh, say, for example, I have a big area of yellow and it's just not working. It's almost there. And, and that's, that's the thing where you reach a point in a painting where you say, okay, it's, it's okay. I, you know, it's not that I don't like it, but it's not exactly what I, I do want. And unless I get exactly what I want, it's not gonna have the vibrancy, vibrancy um, that I want it to have. So if I'm really stuck with a color like that, say yellow, <clears throat> I'll just take the, the opposite on the color wheel, uh, like blue or green or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and put that there instead of the yellow. And quite often it works, um, sometimes not, but uh, uh, I, it's just one of those things that, again, you just work, work through it um, and have the faith that you're gonna find it in the end. When you say the ballerina yeah. tiny that you've done, which is beautiful, what was one of the hardest things to do on her? Serena? Yeah. Um, um, the shadowing is beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Um, Serena was, it, it was uh, a painting that went quite smoothly for me overall. Uh, I just, I had a very good connection with Serena. Um, and uh, I really knew right from the outset uh, with her, uh, what I wanted to do and the expression I wanted to have on her face. So it wasn't a real tough one. Um, there's been others where um, it's been a lot tougher. Um, it, again, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but it's just a process that, that you go through and you have to be really self-critical um, and and you have to refuse to kind of settle for something that's okay um, um, until I, I feel it's a, the best that I can possibly do. Uh, and I won't stop. Is there a reason you never sell calories other than the obvious? Well, um, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Um, I, I dealt with galleries very early in my career and, and on a couple of occasions, I didn't have very positive uh, uh, relationships with them, um, which kind of soured me. But the main reason is a purely financial one. Um, I, I view this as my job. Uh, it takes me about two months to do a painting like that. And I figured to, when I set my prices, I figure, okay, if I was out there in the world working, what would I want to make over a two month period, seven days a week? Uh, so I set my price based on that. If I go to a gallery, um, they're going to say that price is way too high. Uh, when we add our percentage on, we won't be able to sell it because the price will be too high. And I figure for the amount of work that I put in, the amount of experience that I have as an artist, the amount of years I've been doing it, that I want to get full value for the paintings that I produce, not half price. Um, and uh, I'm not prepared to lower the prices so the galleries can sell it <clears throat> at the price that I would normally sell it at. Um, and I just have felt that, um, now don't get me wrong, if, if a gallery came along that was a really good fit for me, that I connected with the person who ran the gallery. Um, they did the work uh, that, that would benefit me. I would have no trouble with dealing with the gallery, but I, uh, I haven't found that yet. And I'm not really looking very hard um, you know, to, mm -hmm. to find it. Uh, How did you know somebody that creates a beautiful piece and it's a product through your service? How do you know your work? Because 
if you start stacking up on two, three paintings that are already done, you might start saying, well, I could probably let that go for a couple grand less. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I generally don't. Um, so um, with, uh, with most people, um, the price is the price. And, um, and, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, but I am flexible, uh, depending on the person I'm doing it for, uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, um, I, I can be flexible with the prices too. But, you know, in the arts, everybody wants something for less than it's worth. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I've worked very hard uh, over the years to establish what I feel my artwork is worth. And, On the table. Uh, yeah. And I, and I try and stick with that. And, and in order to do that, I've had to turn down a lot of, um, uh, a lot of sales for exactly what you were saying that, you know, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to bargain on this. I'm, I'm, this is the price. This is why it's the price. And, uh, you know, if you were buying a table at Ikea, you're not gonna try and negotiate the price of that. Um, to me, it, it's my job, and like you say, this is how I put food on the table. And each painting tells a story, it gives expression, and it makes you feel something. And you're yes. putting it in your home or your office, and you're going to see it. So might as well take care of that artist, and you'll always remember. That. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it all comes down to people's perception of what value is. And... Uh, um, I believe a beautiful painting in a home has huge value uh, that isn't necessarily financial. Um, and, um, and that's the type of audience that I kind of shoot for is, is people who discover what I do and like what I do, and then they want something for themselves. Who's been an inspiration to you in terms of artists throughout history? Uh, I don't follow contemporary artists hardly at all. Um, there's a Canadian artist named uh, Attila Lukacs, who I, I think is incredible. Um, but he's about the only contemporary artist I kind of follow. Um, the, in history, I really like the German Expressionist artists um, in the, uh, you know, sort of during the Second World War. Uh, I like uh, artists like Gauguin, um, again, uh, people who use really bold colors. Uh, um, that's about it. Um, there's a few sculptors that I, I really, I really love, uh, but uh, I'm pretty. I stay pretty isolated in terms of um, looking at other people's arts. Uh, I, I really don't want to be influenced by other people, and uh, um, I don't follow sort of. Uh, kind of what the market value is for selling artwork or um, I don't create artwork uh, just to sell. Uh, I, every painting I do is a painting that I'm doing for myself. And if somebody likes it, wants to buy it, then mm -hmm. we can talk. Well, it's an uh, it's yes, it is. It, it really is. Uh, and uh, I, I you know, I know that you could find, an artist can find um, a kind of a style or a way of painting, say a landscape that can be very popular and then just do a whole whack of them and sell them. Um, I'm not, in, not interested in doing that. We see all. that a lot in those Canmore galleries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sedona. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, well, and that's another that's another thing with galleries. You know, galleries want to sell work, and and uh, if if a certain thing that you're doing is selling, then they want you to do more of the same thing. Uh, same in music or or any of the arts. And uh, um, you have a deep love for history. I do. Yeah. I Have do. you always been that guy that loves World War II and how things were made and formed life? Yes. Uh, the bulk of my reading is, is that sort of thing. Uh, 
uh, individuals in extreme circumstances. And, you know. I appreciate your time though today, Gordon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm happy I we did uh, Zoom over just a call because it's. Yeah. Is this I your agree. first Zoom? It's my first Zoom. Um, and look at me, all set up and ready to go. I I've love completed. it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Gordon. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And thanks for inviting me. I, I appreciate it.